invite you to join us for the morning worship service of Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church. We welcome you as we worship the Lord together. Thank you very much. Gorgeous. Welcome home. It is great to be here. You know, sometimes we're in a complacency part of life where we're looking around and everything kind of seems the same. But when you get a little different perspective, when you allow yourself to see something differently, maybe uh, change your perspective or whatever, you, uh, you, you experience revival. And we need that. We need that in our lives in very, very special ways today. So hopefully listening to God today will help all of us uh, real, realize revival in our souls and in our lives. Welcome to this place. Some of you are new. This is your first time at Trinity on the Hill. We want you to know that you're a very, very special guest with us today. We'd like to ask you to follow the good example of our members. And there's a welcome folder on every pew. If you'll sign in the registration section of that, perhaps one of them will hand it to you to do that. That will be great. If you have any questions about us around here, what we do at Trinity on the Hill, our programming and, and things that are available, especially if you'd like to join this body of believers and serve Christ here, we'd really like to talk to you about that. But now to the task at hand, let's worship God in spirit and in truth. Love Unlimited this year has a theme called Revival, and we're going to take that theme this morning for our worship service from Psalm 85 and the concluding hymn. We're going to put that together for our call to worship. So as you're, avail as you're able, let us stand as we read responsibly. 
Lord, it's been a long time since we enjoyed a season of refreshing. Revive us again. Our witness seems to be ineffectual and powerless. Revive us again. We confess that we have forsaken our first love of Jesus. Revive us again. Restore us again, O Lord, that we may rejoice in you. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Let us start with our hymn of praise, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, number 89. Let us join together in our affirmation of faith as printed in your bulletin. We believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the Lord of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the Lord of our life and death. We believe that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. With his help, we can remain faithful when tempted, peaceful when troubled, and loving when opposed. We believe that the church is the body of Christ. Open to his power, we can bring healing to the broken, hope to the despair, and good news to the lost. We believe that in all things we can be more than conquerors, for neither death nor life, neither the present nor the future, neither suffering nor struggles, 
can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and a visible sign of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of His righteousness and heirs to life eternal. And those receiving this sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples. And they are initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, which holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And all of this is God's gift to us without price. Glory. Brent, Christina, let me ask you these questions on behalf of our congregation concerning your Christian faith. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness and repent of your sin? And do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and to follow him as your Lord and Master in this life? I do. And for this particular day, will you nurture your daughter in Christ's holy church so that by your own teaching, by your own example, and by your own faith, she will be led to accept this grace for herself to lead her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. And what name have you given your daughter? Olivia Catherine Wake. Olivia Catherine Lake, we baptize you in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may I present her to her spiritual family. But first, I'm going to take a little detour. This is Ollie Kate. That's what she's going to be known as. Did you know that her father, Brent, was a member of Love Unlimited? That was a few years ago, wasn't it, Brent? A few. A few. (laughs) Well, she needs to know how to sing glory to God. And so this morning, she's going to have an example of how glorious you sound today. So you're going to teach her how to do that. Now, congregation, she also needs to hear about the stories of Jesus. And I want to tell you something. This is the good news. Ollie Cade has already attended Vacation Bible School. She was there every single night as Christina and Brent taught Vacation Bible School. Well, she's going to need some other teachers as well. So she looks to us to teach her these stories of Christ. She also needs to see an example of how we serve Christ. Whether we do that in our jobs or at school or in a special mission, She needs us to show her an example of what it means to be a servant of Jesus Christ. And do you as a congregation accept the responsibility of assisting Brent and Christina in the fulfillment of these baptismal vows today? And do you undertake to provide ministry and opportunities for Christian nurture and fellowship? If you do, say, with God's help, we do. With God's help, we do. I'm going to ask mom and dad and grandparents to lay hands upon Ollie Kate as we pray together. Gracious God in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful gift of life into Brent and Christina's family. We pray that she'll never know a day that she does not know the great love and grace of Jesus Christ and help her to be a strong servant as she looks to her family to lead her. Bless this mother and father so that they can be strong in those days in which it's always tempting to just give up. May they always be strong in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now all he wants to go back to mom and dad. God blessings be with each of you, and God be with you. I think so. It's really easy to wonder about the world that Ollie Kate has been born into. A lot of us are very concerned about our nation, about our world. In fact, when we read the news, uh, we get anxiety and struggle with What in the world is going on? The only antidote, people, to that is 
this beautiful, simple chorus, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. So let's sing it together. This kneeling rail is open if you would like to come and get on your knees before God today. Uh, let's sing it as we prepare our hearts for prayer. As we continue in the spirit of prayer, please join me. O oh Lord our God, everlasting Father, ruling in holiness above, we praise you for the gift of another day and the joy of being together in your house this morning. We remember your promise to us in Jesus Christ that whenever two or more are gathered in your name, you are there. We do believe in you, Father. We believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. We believe in your Holy Spirit. Speak to us your word of grace, of hope, and of love, according to our different needs. Remind us that despite all our differences, we are made one through Jesus Christ. Let that oneness be seen in the way we love one another, as you have loved us in Christ. Father, be with those who are hurting this day, for those who are sick and for their healing, for, with those who have suffered loss, with those who doubt your goodness, and with those who do not yet know you. Grant that our worship today will glorify your name and that everything we do will bring you glory to your kingdom. Bless this church, O oh God, as we speak to be faithful to your call. Help, e help each of us find our place in your family and to trust that there is always room at your table for one more. Open our hearts, O oh God, to the leading of your Holy Spirit, that we might not only hear your word this day, but receive it, and that it may be planted in us and bear fruit in our lives that is pleasing to you and that we may be able to apply your word to our lives as we go into the world. We make our prayer in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stand and greet each other in the name of the risen Lord today. What a beautiful day this is in the name of Jesus Christ, and we're so glad that you can be watching us through this broadcast. You know, sometimes ruts are very comfortable. We move along in life, and it's good to know what's going to happen day after day. Sometimes we miss a lot when we're in that rut, things that are going on around us. So it's very important to take a fresh view, take a new look at those things that are happening. And we want you to do that today. That can only be the only way that revival can take place. So recognize the love of Jesus all around you in so many ways. And thank you so much for watching. Let's go to the kids. Good morning, boys and girls. Hey, I want to tell you, when I was a kid, what scared me to death. I mean, I was shaking. I was putting my head under the covers. It scared me so bad. 
You know what it was? Thunder. Nope. It was an old monster movie in black and white. Oh, shoot, I hate that. Oh. And when I got older, it dawned on me, why did I even look at that movie? I should have just left the room. The werewolf. That one scared me more than anything else. <gasps> of course, now when I look at that movie, ah, it doesn't scare me at all. Nah, I'm over that kind of stuff. But I was thinking this morning, perhaps there are things that you get scared of, right? Thunder. Somebody mentioned thunder. The darkness. Some of us get scared of the darkness. Some of us are scared of dogs, especially the big dogs. It's cats? Are you scared of cats? No. No. no, no. Nobody. Your mom is scared of cats. Okay. Well, you know, what we're scared of sometimes is real. I mean, it's real to be scared of, like, say, a bear. But sometimes we get scared, and it's just our imagination, like ghosts and pretend monsters. And sometimes it's a combination of both, reality and imagination. For instance, when you're afraid of the dark, the dark is real. But the things we think are in the dark, well, you know, our mind just kind of gets crazy and we get scared like that. Well, the good news is, in the Bible, it's always saying, time after time after time, don't be afraid. And it's usually an angel who's telling us, don't be afraid. Now, I don't know about you, but if an angel appeared to me and said, don't be afraid, I would just faint from fear. I mean, it would be scary. So no wonder angels always start off their conversation by saying, do not be afraid. And then plop, we go down like that. Well, today, the youth choir is going to have a special uh, Bible story from a letter to a young man by the name of Timothy. And the first thing that letter says to Timothy is this, don't be afraid. God did not give you a spirit of fear or even timidity. I don't know if you know what that word timidity means yet, but it means that you shouldn't be scared of things that God has asked you to do in life because he's going to give you the power to do it. Now, as you grow older, you're going to grow out of being scared most of the time. And there'll be bigger things for you to probably have to get scared of. But I want you to know that our faith in Jesus Christ will give us the power of not being afraid. And he will give us the power of strength and love and self-control. So let's remember that as you go through your day, that God will be with you and you don't need to be afraid. So let's pray. Holy God in heaven, we thank you for each of our children here. We pray that you will watch them grow as they, throughout the summer, through their mind and body, but especially their growth in their soul, and teach them not to be afraid. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. If you're going to Children's Church, you'll be following Miss Lillian over there on uh, your left, or if you're sitting with your parents, you can return to your pews at that time. Last week at the offering, I said thank you for your generosity for allowing us to be able to have a wonderful vacation Bible school. Sunday through Thursday night, we just had a blast. We had everything we needed. And that's because of your generosity through your tithes and offerings, and as well as through your special gifts. Today, I want to thank you for your generosity that allows us to have a wonderful ministry called Love Unlimited as we send uh, almost 100 people up the East Coast to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and His love. Through your regular offerings, you have really helped us as we provide staff and a place for them to practice, but also through your gifts of buying the poinsettias. How many of you have bought a poinsettia? I mean, you just can't live in Augusta without having a Love Unlimited poinsettia. Now, if you've missed out on that joy, come November, we're going to give you another chance. Also, for those of you who bought stock in the Love Unlimited mission, uh, we want to say thank you because that helps defray the cost of our individual students. When they come back on June 21st, they're going to have a 6.30 concert that evening, and our stockholders are invited to be here. Well, actually, everybody's invited to come and be a part of it, but know that you've had a part in sending this group off on their mission, not just a tour, but a mission, a ministry. With that in mind, we ask the ushers to come forward so we can continue to be generous for the ministry of Trinity on the Hill all this summer, uh, here and there and everywhere. Holy God in heaven, thank you for the generosity you've blessed us in this life. 
May we imitate your generosity in our lives by being generous to your church so that we can be in ministry everywhere. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a lot of talent and gifts in this group of uh, young people behind me, not just musical, but sports and in many areas. But we do like to highlight some of that talent. And today, Wesley Hamilton is going to play her viola for us, accompanied by Lisa Roberts, which we appreciate so much. Um, Wesley's been accepted into Bavard Music School for the summer, and this is her audition piece. So she's thinking of this as a rehearsal as well. So thank you, Wesley.
If we could have our adult chaperones to come forward as we dedicate this choir to the mission in which they have been training for. They have committed themselves nine months ago to be on this journey of spreading a revival uh, up the east coast of the United States. So y'all just come on across. Don't be bashful about Everybody wants to be on that side, don't they? There you go. Be brave. Be brave. Cross the center line. Way to go, Mark. You're a good man. Steve, good to have you with us, too. All right, so we're going to ask some questions of commitment. We know that you've already said yes to this because every one of you have a little card that you uh, signed, and I believe your parents signed it as well. So if your uh, child is up here and you're a parent, please stand. We want you to be standing during this particular section as well. Most of the parents were here at 8.30, but we know we have a, yes, we've got quite a few parents with us at 11 o'clock as well. Tour members, let me ask you, you're going to be a witness for Jesus Christ and Trinity on the Hill, United Methodist Church. Will you take upon yourself that role to be a faithful witness? If you will, say, with God's help, I will. With God's help, I will. The next question I would ask you is about your group together as, as a body. Will you immerse yourself in the attitude of love and service toward one another as you spend 10 glorious days on a bus with each other? If you'll do that, please say, with God's help, I will. With God's help, I will. And for some of these people up front, this is perhaps maybe the most important question. Will you submit yourself to the adults' leadership and to follow their guidelines and their love throughout the next 10 days? If you will, please say, please say, with God's help, I will. With God's help, I will. And I know Roy is most appreciative of that. Parents, thank you. You may be seated. For the adults who are going on our trip, uh, they have uh, also been with this choir for quite a few uh, rehearsals, some of them all the way from the very beginning. They play an integral role as they go along, not just as chaperones, but as examples of their own faith in Jesus Christ. So for the adults, I have this question. For each of you, whether you're staff or you volunteered to go on this, why you would volunteer? (laughs) I'm just kidding. Uh, For those of you who are going on this trip, Will you model the care of God the Father? Will you model the love of Jesus Christ and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit in every thought, word, and deed? If you will, say it with God's help, I will. With God's help, I will. And I know you will, because I know each one of you, and you'll do a great job. Congregation, you've really supported this uh, mission of Love Unlimited this year, but now they're going to ask for something special, and it's called prayer. There's a special prayer booklet that covers every day of their journey with a song, a scripture, and where they're at at that particular time. You're invited to take one of those home with you and follow through and pray each and every day starting on Wednesday when they will leave uh, the campus and head up the East Coast. And so I'll ask the congregation, will you endeavor to support the Love Unlimited Mission Tour of Revival with your prayers, your prayers, and your prayers. If you will, please say, with God's help, we will. With God's help, we will. I'll ask you to stretch your arms out to the choir and to our adult chaperones as we pray for them. Gracious and holy God, it is a mission that this group is about to go on, a mission of great love, of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for all that happens will be to the glory of your kingdom. Even when things go wrong, may it all turn out to the glory of of your kingdom. Bless each student who goes. May their lives, may their hearts, their souls be revived so that when they return for the homecoming concert, ah, we shall all be blessed by the revival in their hearts and lives. Give strength to these adults, give perseverance and wisdom and love, and let them always know of our support of them. Bless us as a congregation as we wait for them to return to us and then to enjoy the revival which has happened in their hearts and lives. These things we pray in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Our choir is going to be leaving us at this point in the service because they have rehearsals all afternoon, and they've been here since 8 o'clock, and they look a little tired, don't they? So we're going to let them go ahead and and, uh, leave, which leaves you with me. Now, I've got good news and bad news. We are not live on television today. We're being preempted by uh, the French Open, I believe is what it is. And so I can preach as long as I want to. (laughs) 
I'll let you figure out the good news and the bad news part of all that. <laughs> uh, I want to begin by simply telling you why the, the, the title of the sermon is Ruts and Revival. Uh, the theme which the youth picked out for their own uh, tour is revival. It comes from a song which they didn't sing today, but they'll sing at the homecoming uh, tour. And it's found on the very last page, uh, which is the devotion for June 21st. That's the Sunday in which they will sing for us at Sunday night at 630. And uh, we're going to be using their scripture that they have on that last day. But I want to bring this forward and preach about it as the beginning of the trip. As I told them earlier in the 830 service, if you're going to try to bring revival to the churches you're going to, you better already be in revival yourself. But here's the song in which the theme is based on. It's titled, Burning in My Soul. There is power, power, here in this hour, this hour. We're all together, together, waiting here as one. Whoa, hear the sound from heaven. Whoa, a mighty wind, a mighty rushing wind. Whoa, we are called to revival. God, let your fire fall again. It's burning in my soul. All your sons and your daughters, dreaming the dreams of the Father, seeing the signs and the wonders, the kingdom of God. I cannot contain it, the fire inside. I cannot contain it. So let it shine. I cannot contain it, this light of mine. Can't wait to hear that song <laughs> as they come back from their own revival and their time together. It's going to be wonderful. The scriptures that uh, goes with this song is from Isaiah and 2 Timothy. When we get to 2 Timothy, I'll ask you to hold your Bibles open because we're looking at a little bit more than just the few verses that are referenced there. But as you're able, let us stand as we give honor to the reading of God's holy word. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning with verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? <laughs> the Lord is the everlasting God. He will not grow tired or weary, and His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And then to the words of Paul to his young protege, Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with the fifth verse. I am reminded of your sincere faith, Timothy, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And may revival be in our hearts and lives as well. You may be seated. The story goes, there's an old sign by a dirt road. Everybody remember what a dirt road is? <laughs> You've got to go a long way these days to find a dirt road. But there's a sign on an old dirt road out west that said, Select your rut carefully because you will be in it for the next 20 miles. <laughs> Select your rut carefully, because you might be in it for a while. Some of us get into ruts in our lives. Uh, sometimes it's just because we're just trying to cope from day to day. Sometimes it's just moment to moment. We're just enduring. We're, we're just surviving. We're hanging on, if you will, just sticking it out. And, and life is in a rut. We've used that term so many times. Did you know that scientists have even developed a boredom proneness scale to study boredom? They will give you a test and they can find out whether you're prone to be bored or in a rut in your life. Now, there's a lot of theories about the causes of boredom. If you look far enough back to Freud and his psychiatry, it's because of repressed emotions. But, you know, for Freud, everything was repressed emotions, so I just kind of discount him a little bit. 
But they also say that if it's a difference in your personality trait. Some of us, because of one trait or another, tend to be more bored or in a rut. Those of us who are adrenaline junkies, uh, we, we keep raising the threshold for reward and pleasures, and we just can't find anything to, to satisfy us. We get bored pretty easy. Maybe that's why men get more bored than women, according to the, the scientists. They're saying that today, boredom is mostly caused by a lack of the ability to entertain oneself. The lack of ability to entertain oneself. That's probably due to the fact that we are entertained by outside sources so much through television, media, magazines. And in, in the early service, I turned around, looked at the kids and said, and yes, video games. It just seems we can't satisfy ourselves without that outside stimulus coming in, and so we get bored. Some people say it's because of a low or lack of self-awareness. We don't know who we are. We haven't been with ourselves alone long enough to ask the question, what makes me happy? What makes me fulfilled in life? It's kind of exemplified in the question that we get sometimes at night when we're thinking about, well, what should we do tonight? What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Well, I don't know. I asked you first. What do you want to do? You've had that conversation with your spouse, I'm sure. And so we, we get in ruts in our lives. I know you've all heard about the metaphor, which is also a myth, I'll explain it to you, about the frog that uh, is put in a pot of boiling water. It jumps out as quickly as it can. But however, if you put that same frog in a pot of tepid water, cool water, and then slowly heat it up, that he'll just sit there and smile until he's boiled to death. You've heard that story, right? It's a metaphor. It's not really a scientific fact, but it's, it's a metaphor to help us understand that as human beings, we're prone to just get used to gradual change until finally our lives are out of control or in danger. What needs to happen in that metaphor is for that frog to have a clarifying moment. You know, that time when the water gets kind of hot and he says, wait a minute. If I stay here much longer, I'm going to die. <laughs> and so he, he needs that clarifying moment that we all hope to get to. Which brings me to another story about a frog, but a different frog. This is about a frog and a group of his friends jumping around the countryside when they come across a dirt road. They all cross the dirt road except the last frog gets stuck in a rut, a deep rut. All of his friends gather around trying to help him get out, but they can't get him out. And it's getting dark, so they have to leave real quick, and they leave their friend in that deep rut. He's not able to get out. The next day as his friends are hopping around, they see their friend. He's hopping around too. What happened, they said. We left you in the rut. He says, I know. You left me in that rut. Well, how did you get out? He says, I couldn't get out. But a truck came by and I got out. <laughs> Saying that sometimes what we need is that catalyst, that, that empathy of faith and struggle that helps us understand that we have to get out of the rut. We have that clarifying moment, that compelling reason to get out of our rut of apathy, our rut of stress, maybe even a rut in our faith. I love the definition uh, that describes ruts compared to graves. You know what the difference in a rut and a grave is? A rut has no ends. It just keeps on going forever. What is the antidote for ruts? Well, you may have realized by the title of the sermon, it's revival, a refreshing of our souls. Revival means that there was something that was vital in our lives concerning our faith. That moment when we understood the love of Jesus Christ in our lives and we saw a great future of a growing relationship. But then came that season of neglect and forgetfulness and suddenly we realized that there was a need for recovery. There was a need for revival. And revival is not just a religious word. We use that word throughout our uh, culture. When there's a, a new uh, version of a particular play or movie, it's called a, a revival. Or perhaps when some of your old clothes comes back into vogue, it's called a revival. Or what I think the word is retro, isn't it? Yeah, retro. I told the youth this morning, I have a pair of uh, pants that are bell-bottom, hip-hugger, multicolored <laughs> that I wore on the 1971 youth choir tour called The Natural High. <laughs> and I'm just waiting for that to come back into 
into vogue. Now, I can't wear them myself, <laughs> but I'm going to sell them to somebody. <laughs> revival. The first thing we need to know about revival is that we can trust God, that God desires us to be restored, to revive us again. This is God's desire for us. It's not something we have to chase. He's there waiting for us to be revived. If you remember the Isaiah text we read today, we pulled it out of the context of where the people of God had been sent into exile, which is just a huge time out. They are in a foreign land. Nobody speaks their language. They don't worship the way they worship, and they're finding it very difficult to be faithful to their God. And so Isaiah addresses them in that 40th chapter. And he addresses them with kind of some uh, snarky remarks, if you, especially if you read it from the message, Eugene Peterson's translation. He addresses the people of God by saying, Why would you ever complain or whine that God has lost track of me? He doesn't care what happens to me. Don't you know anything? Haven't you been listening? God doesn't come and go like fads. God lasts forever. He's the creator of all you can see or even imagine. He doesn't get tired out. He doesn't pause to catch his breath. He knows everything inside and out. Therefore, God energizes those who get tired. He gives fresh strength to the dropouts. For even young people will tire and drop out. Even young folks in their prime will stumble and fall. But those who wait upon the Lord get fresh strength. They spread their wings and they soar like eagles. They run and they don't get tired. They walk and they don't lag behind. God desires for us to be revived, to be restored. He is pursuing us with that refreshing for our hearts and souls. We don't have to chase around God to get that revival in our hearts. All we have to do is turn around and we're out of the rut because He's there pursuing us. All we have to do is turn around. You know what the word for repent literally means is a change of mind. Or we could perhaps push that definition to a change of direction. Instead of being in the rut, we turn around and we encounter that living God who desires us to be refreshed in our hearts and our souls. Now, not only does God desire that for us, but He's also kind of given us a pathway to that reviving of our spirits. I find it in 2 Timothy as Paul writes to his young protege. Now, growing up as a young person, they always told us to read First and Second Timothy because he was very young and inexperienced. But as I grew up and studied the letters of Timothy, I find out he was not inexperienced at all. He was young, younger than Paul, but at the time of this writing, Timothy had been on the missionary ministry trail with Paul for over 10 years. He had even, he'd been to every city in the known world at that time, including the big city of Rome, where he stayed with Paul during his imprisonment. Now, that's a lot of maturity. But even then, Paul found a need to remind his young protege, to remind all of us, because he uses the word us, fan into flame that gift which God has given to you. Rekindle that gift of God. Revive that gift of God. Because God has not given us a spirit of timidity. He has not given us a spirit of fear. And then he lines it out for us. He's given us a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. The spirit of power is that Pentecostal power, not, not just the charismatic part of it, but the power that gives us strength, that gives us influence, authority, and clout as a Christian under God. Left to ourselves, I think all of us would perhaps be incapable of remaining faithful to anything, much less God. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, we are revived anew each and every day. It is this presence of the Holy Spirit which keeps us going in this life. It is that power of His Holy Spirit. Christianity is not a religion or a faith in the sanctuary on Sunday. It is a faith that is alive each and every day. And the Holy Spirit, the presence of the risen Lord, is there for each of us at every moment if we simply turn around and encounter it. The second part of that gift is love. We cannot re retain the, 
the flames of God's gift of grace to us unless we can relate to others with that same gift of love and grace. As we reach out to other people in the name of Jesus Christ, we begin to fan into flame the gift that He has given us. His love for us means that we can love others, which is the great new commandment He gave us. Love one another as I have loved you. And all through the scriptures, you'll see where Jesus talked about how we love one another, how we love the poor and the outcast, how we turn the cheek, how we go the extra mile, give the extra coat. Each time we choose to love someone in the name of Jesus Christ, we are putting another log on the fire of our faith. And perhaps if we are suffering from a lack of fire, maybe it's because, not that we haven't related to anybody, but we haven't related to anybody through the love of Jesus Christ, to care for them, to reach out to them in their pain and in their need. The Holy Spirit gives us power, gives us love for others, and then there's that self-control, which just seems like an odd word to stick at the end of power, love, and then suddenly it's self-control. I like the way some of the new translations are using self-discipline as a part of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Self-discipline as a part of the gift of the Holy Spirit. To avoid becoming spiritually useless, we are encouraged to practice the self-disciplined spiritual lifestyle. And as Paul writes his letter to Timothy, he gives him two examples. Number one is the example of prayer day in and day out. Not just when we're in trouble, the blue light prayer is what I like to call that, as you look in the rearview mirror and you see that blue light. But a prayer of, of searching each and every day. And the second one is very close to that, and that is the daily reading of Scripture. To use this resource of God's holy words throughout the generations will fan the flames of our faith into a hot fire. Without it, we run out of fuel. The Scriptures is the fuel that's a part of what makes us faithful Christians. And I think another aspect of self-discipline, which I raised in the early service with the youth here, I says self-discipline means that you honor the boundaries. You know, in other words, the rules that they have for retreat. Have you ever seen the rules that these people go by? (laughs) It's quite the list. And they're so wonderful at following that. But part of being self-disciplined means that we honor the boundaries that God has set up. And I know that goes against the grain of American individuality where we bump against all the boundaries we can. In fact, we're rewarded for going past those boundaries often. But part of fanning the flame of our faith into fire is that we honor the boundaries that God has set up. Now, we have that God desires renewal in our lives. We have the fact that he's not given us the Holy Spirit of fear, but he's given us the Holy Spirit of strength and of love and of self-control. But at the heart of the matter, and this is where Paul covers it in verses 9 and 10. So if you still have your scriptures open to 2 Timothy chapter 1, look into that 9th and 10th verse. Because the heart of the matter is the gospel itself. He says, it is God who has saved us and chosen us for this holy work, Not because we deserved it. Not because we spent the last nine months practicing and practicing and practicing. Not because we've been especially good boy and girl all of our lives. But because God's plan all along was to show us love and kindness through Jesus Christ. And now he has made all this plain to us by the coming of Jesus Christ who has broken And here's the important part. Who has broken the power of death, the power of sin, and yes, even the power of boredom and being in a rut. Christ has showed us the way of everlasting life through trusting Him. Not just acknowledging Jesus, not just saying, I believe in Jesus, but by entrusting Jesus Christ. The 85th Psalm, which is a part of the call to worship this morning, was a prayer, a pleading prayer from the psalmist. Now, I used it as a part of the last hymn that we're going to sing that's in your bulletin. But I want you to hear the whole psalm as this psalmist pleads for this revival. May this be your prayer this morning. 
May you not leave this place without a desire to be revived in your own heart and soul, to be restored even as this psalmist prays, Lord, our Savior, restore us again and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all the generations? Oh, Lord, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O oh Lord, and grant to us your salvation. Revive us again, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Would you please stand as we sing that great camp meeting hymn, Revive Us Again. It's found in your bulletin. There you go. with this folks to get revived I want all the women when we get to the chorus to sing the hallelujahs all the men thine the glory ladies hallelujah men amen only say amen sing amen, amen. okay and then we all come together on that ending revive us again now if you don't do it well the first this next verse I will call you out that's exactly right all right here we go On the Hill United Methodist Church, a production of Trinity Methodist Television, as an outreach ministry to those of the Augusta area. If you found this to be a meaningful service, let us hear from you by calling 738-8822 or writing Trinity on the Hill, 1330 Montesano Avenue, Augusta, Georgia, 30904.